Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and the heavens, moon, and stars have held a fascination for men and women on earth as long as we've walked on this planet. And so many of us remember well that evening, early morning in July of 1969, when Neil Armstrong took one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, becoming the first person in all of human history to step foot on the moon. And now there's a worldwide competition organized by the X Prize Foundation, sponsored by Google, to see which privately funded space program can be the first to land a spacecraft, a robotic spacecraft on the moon. The Google Lunar X Prize will award $30 million to the first private company. It can only have 10% of government funding. A private company that can put a vehicle on the moon that will travel at least 50, 500 meters on the lunar surface and will then send back to Earth high-definition video. Well, as you might imagine, many space aeronautic companies, many companies involved in space exploration, the world of space, they jumped at the chance to be the first to put a vehicle on the moon and win $30 million. 33 companies entered the Google Lunar X Prize competition. There are now only 18 companies remaining. And one of the two leading contenders is an Israeli company that wasn't even in existence before 2010. But three young Israelis had a dream that they could win the Google Lunar X Prize. And so Kfir Damari, Yariv Bash, and Yonatan Weintraub created a company of their own called Space IL. And they set out to raise the $50,000 they would need for the entry fee and then more than $30 million they'd need to create and send a robotic vehicle to the moon from the state of Israel. You know, we often hear how Israel is the startup nation, where innovation and technology have helped shape the character of the Jewish state. But don't ever forget to add the ingredient of chutzpah, good old-fashioned chutzpah, nerve, self-confident nerve, a Jewish conviction from deep inside one's kishkas that, as David Ben-Gurion expressed so perfectly, the impossible simply takes longer. Well, Space IL is on its way to doing what would seem to be the impossible, creating a space industry of, uh, of its own out of nothing in a matter of a few short years, becoming a major contender for the Google Lunar X Prize. And what, is a, what a pleasure it is for me now. It is to you, one of the founders of Space IL, Kafir Damari. And Kafir, it is such a wonderful pleasure for me to have you at this table. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. There are so many questions I want to ask you. First of all, you know, I imagined you would be young. I didn't imagine how young you would be. How old were you in 2010? In 2020, I was 28. 28. And we have your, your two colleagues who are also working with you. In 2010, how old were they? In 2010, one was uh, 25 and one was 30. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. Did you know each other at the time? Uh, we were friends, but not good friends, I would say. Okay. So I've read a little bit about you, but I want to hear it from you. Okay. You know, who, who are you in your first 25 years of life that you suddenly hear about this Google Lunar X Prize? 
you understand, Kfir, to me it's fantastic in a literal sense of the word. It's fantastic for three young people, your kids, thinking you're going to compete for a 30 million Google X lunar prize. Not only that, you're going to create a robotic vehicle that you are going to put on the moon from the state of Israel. Who are you? You know, first of all, where you where were you born and where did you grow up? I was uh, born in uh, actually in uh, Alfa Menashe. Uh, today I live in Tel Aviv. But uh, you're a Sabra. Yeah. Your parents are from where? My father always said that he was born in Israel, so he's an Israeli. <laughs> okay. Uh, my grandmother is uh, my mother is from uh, Morocco. Okay. And what kind of Jewish home did you have growing up in Israel? Uh, Masorti, I would say. Okay, so it's sort of, in, in some way, my, the Masorti movement is often referred to here in America as, as, a, as a branch of conservative Judaism. So you were, you were not Orthodox, but at the same time, yeah. there was a real strong Jewish identity in your home. True. Okay. Where did you go to school? Uh, I learned in the beginning in Alfem and and then I went to Tel Aviv to study just next to the university because I started my first degree. Uh, when, I, when I was in the ninth uh, uh, grade. Really? Yeah. Oh, so you're really very, very bright. Yes, Kafir, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and do you go into the IDF? Yeah. And what do you do there? I was in the intelligence forces. I was an officer in, uh, in a highly elite uh, technological <laughs> unit there. <laughs> okay. You, you complete your service, and then you go into the university again? Yeah. Where? Uh, in Ben Gurion. Okay. I didn't finish my degree in ma mathematics when I was younger, but I went to do a communication system engineering yes. degree. And then I also did my master's, also okay. in Ben Gurion. In communications? Yes. Okay. When I read that, it did not sound to me like that was necessarily space aeronautics related. Am I correct? It is relevant. Yes. Because eventually you need to send uh, data and images back to Earth. <laughs> So it is relevant, but it's true that my focus is more in internet and cyber security and not space. Okay, fair enough. Then at some point you hear about this prize, mm -hmm. and you heard me say it, there's chutzpah involved, dreams involved, passion involved. I want to hear you tell the story. You hear about it. What motivates you? What even... How do you even dare to think, I can do this? Tell me the story, Kafir. So, so I'll tell you, it's the three of us. Uh, I'm a communication system engineer. Yariv is an electronic engineer. And actually, Jonathan is our space guy. Uh, he, uh, as I said, he was very young, but he uh, were, had a lot of experience in, in the space. He worked in the Israeli aerospace industry, and even in the past, in his army uni, uh, duty, he was also part of uh, developing Israeli satellites. Uh, so the three of us said, I would even go a step before that, and I would say that for me it started in a, on a Facebook post. Yariv actually wrote on his Facebook that he wanted to open the Israeli team competing in the Google Luna X Prize. It's his idea then? He actually... He initiated it. He initiated it. And, and you were intrigued? When I saw that, I just answered, if you're serious, I'm in. And this is how it started. The three of us uh, met together and started to design actually how we're going to do that how we're going to build the, the smallest spacecraft that was ever designed to land on the moon. Back then, it was even smaller than the current designs. It's a bit bigger now. Um, but this is how it started. How uh, big is it, by the way? When we started, it was in the size of a Coke bottle, I would say. Today, it's more um, like a washing machine, a small washing machine. OK. Now, you have nothing at that point. There's no company. There's no money. It's three young people with, an, with a dream and an idea. True. What do you do next? First of all, you need to realize that we, ha we decided that we want to register around a month and a half before the registration ended. Yeah, it it turns out, uh, I'm sure the audience understands, you decide to enter this competition. The deadline for entering is almost upon you. Exactly. You have very little time, and you need $50,000 for the entry fee. True. Okay. And... I want to set the context of what, what's in my own mind, and then you describe. I'm saying to myself, look, okay, you're very bright. You've got three people in various fields. You put them together. You've got a very interesting nucleus. 
but you're not in this industry. Nobody knows you. You're, you're just three kids. How do you, how, first of all, chutzpah isn't even the word. It, it's more than, it's chutzpah, it's chutzpah times chutzpah. But you have to go somewhere and convince somebody with money that the three of you are the people that they should trust and trust to build a space program. And there is no space program in Israel, correct? There is a space program, but, uh, but it's not. The, it's, this is the first uh, spacecraft. First spacecraft, yeah. okay. Out of, and you're not in this industry already, correct? Uh, we had, uh, we were very lucky to have Jonathan. Jonathan was because of his experience in the IDF. In, the, in his IDF, and he's also been working in the Israeli aerospace industries. Is so, he known? Is he a known figure? He's young, so you know, <laughs> known is a relative thing. Right. <laughs> okay, so that's what I kept saying to myself. How in the world do three young people, you know, you meet in a cafeteria, you meet in a diner, whatever, but then you've got to get up, you've got to go into the world, and somebody has to take you seriously. Mm -hmm. If you're looking, not for $30 million, 50000 is, is, you don't get that every day. Sure. How does it happen? So when we started, as I said, we sat down and tried to design uh, the spacecraft. It was, a, it was a lot of Jonathan's work because he was the one that uh, had the experience there. Um, but we realized from the early beginning that we have a month and a half, we have no chance in actually building the real blueprint for the spacecraft. We realized that the only thing we can do is the next best thing, and this is to find a winning team. So we did our basic designs, and then we went to the head of the Israeli space uh, in agency. And we went to the Israeli aerospace industry space facility manager. And we went to the head of the Weizmann Institute and Tel Aviv University and the IDC. And a lot of groups and organizations, we were, we were able to get an appointment. Because? And through connections we had in the past. You didn't have a lot of time. We didn't have a lot of time. Very often, if you want to meet somebody, even if they say yes, it's six weeks from now and four weeks from now, you were able to do this rather quickly. Rather quickly, and I would say that so this is something that for me, I think, can happen in Israel. <laughs> in, in other places, it's probably hard to do so. Uh, but we were able to do that. And we actually got to those meetings and said, hello, we want to land uh, the first Israeli uh, spacecraft in the size of a Coke bottle on the moon. <laughs> Do you understand why this sounds so unbelievable to me? Maybe it is the American experience as opposed to the Israeli experience, but I just can't imagine three young people walking in into, to, you know, Harvard University or Yale University or Stanford University and saying to their department that does this, we want to do this and to be taken seriously. I'm asking you again, can you, is there, is there something when you were in these meetings, did you sense something positive happening? And if so, you, you would understand why I'm s so surprised. Something about this had to both thrill you but surprise you at the same time. True. I, I would say it's a combination. You know, the fact that we ourselves, you know, had the chutzpah <laughs> to, to do so, I think it's something that is uh, really relative to the way we were born and raised. I think that each one of us uh, was raised in an environment that let him feel that no matter what he will do, he will always be safe. He will always have a protective nest uh, to save him, and this is why we allowed ourselves to do that. Uh, but I think it's also the fact that when we went in and we told the people seriously that this is what we wanted to do, uh, some of them said, okay, it will be more complicated than what you think, <laughs> but it's so exciting. It, it, it's so exciting that I'm with you. And this is how it was. Uh, the head of the Weizmann in uh, Institute, the Who? head of uh, Daniel Zeifman, Professor Daniel Zeifman, uh, um, Professor Itzik Ben Israel, the head of the Israeli uh, Space Agency, uh, the former uh, manager of the Israeli uh, uh, Airspace Industries Space Facility Manager, and all of them just heard us talking, and they were excited from the fact, the potential, that Israel will land a spacecraft on the moon. And they said, you know, it's crazy, but we want it to, ha we want it to happen. So we'll do everything in our power to help you. Why didn't they say one more thing? 
great idea, we'll do it, you can have a role, but we'll do it. Why would they give it to the three of you? Why would they say, we'll help you, as opposed to, to their saying, thanks for bringing us this idea. Obviously, we have the people who are doing this much longer than you. We'll be happy to include you, but we're going to do it. First of all, I can only assume what they were thinking. Uh, but I think, you know, if, if I'll take it even to a general question, why is, the, why is this the first time that Israel tries to land a spacecraft on the moon? I would say that you needed to have a, an initiative to do that. And, you know, you need a reason. And there wasn't a reason. It's not, uh, if you're trying, it's something else that I would also, uh, I would also say, if you're trying to build a business on landing on the moon, it's a problem. And I would say that for us, uh, we'll go back to the story, we were able to find those amazing people. We were able with them, actually in 10 days, to raise the $50,000. Uh, in 10 days? In 10 days. You raised $50,000. million, uh, $50,000. Yes. From whom? from private individuals that we met and we told them this is our group, this is our, these are the people that support us. Together we want to land an Israeli spacecraft on the moon, but in order to do that we need right now a check from you to help us begin. What was the biggest check? Uh, I think it was $10,000. Okay. It was five to $10,000 donation. Okay. And together in 10 days we were able to raise the money. And the very last day, it was a Friday, I remember, <laughs> because we made sure that the bank will be open on Friday. In Israel it doesn't happen all, all the time. Uh, and the very last day we had enough money and we were able to register in the to the competition. Um, was it hard to register? But I mean by that is, in addition to having money, yeah. what else did you have to prove to Google X Lunar Prize that you were a legitimate contender? Basically, even the money, it's not about you know, uh, the $50,000. Uh, it's about showing that you're serious. So we needed to bring the money, but also to bring paper, papers that will show that we're serious, that we have a concrete plan on how we're going to do that. So it was yes, pretty you hard. Yes, you have to have a written, basically, the equivalent of a business plan. But here it's not a business plan. It's a technical plan yes. that shows you have an idea of what the heck you're doing. Yes. And you did that. You had that. We were able to do that during the nights that we were, uh, while we were raising the money, and the same time working on the, the plan. And very last day, we were able to register. And, but something else happened. In those 10 days that we raised the money, you know, from the early beginning, it was, real, uh, it, it was obvious to us that it's not our spacecraft. It's not the three of us. It's a spacecraft to, it's, it's the Israeli spacecraft. And I would say that today we even expanded that and we would like to say that everyone that feels that Israel is important for him, it's his spacecraft. Uh, but from that reason uh, and from something else, from the, the fact that we realized that we wanted to be the first Israeli spacecraft, but not the last. So we want to make sure that there will be more scientists and engineers to build the next ones. Uh, we decided not to be a company, actually, but to be a nonprofit. And both the prize money is not for us, it's not a company. It will go to promoting science and scientific education. Uh, but also, beside building the spacecraft, which is a huge thing, and I would love to tell you about it, but beside that effort, we also have an educational department, which is working both in Israel and abroad to make sure that that moment will have its, its impact. Uh, and it won't be just, you know, lending, it will be much, much more than that. Mm -hmm. You've created a nonprofit organization. Yes. How many people are working, first of all, how many are employees? And I understand you also have a great number of volunteers. Yes. So how many people work with you now? So we started three years ago, today. Uh, we have uh, 20, 20 full-time employees. Uh, we have more than 250 volunteers. And we have a lot of support. Uh, we have the support of the, the space industry in Israel. We have the support of the Ministry of uh, uh, Science uh, and the Ministry of Education and, and a lot of groups and organizations that are hoping are commercial partners, donors, together working to make it happen. What's your role? Uh, it changes along yes. the way, I would say, uh, to any entrepreneur, I think. Yes. It's to do what you know, <laughs> needs to be done. 
uh, but today I am in charge of the operations and the uh, education, actually making sure that the impact will happen. That's wonderful. Where is it located? We have two offices, one in uh, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv University is donating it, and the other is in the Israeli Aerospace Industries Space Facility uh, in Yehud. Wow. Um, when this, you expect this to be launched, correct? Yes. Yes. And when I said you are one of the major contenders, that's not an exaggeration, correct? Okay. Correct. Where would you launch from? Uh, we're building a very, very small spacecraft. It's actually the smallest spacecraft that was ever designed to land on the moon. Uh, and the fact we're, that we're so small allows us to do something else. We're able actually to connect that, our spacecraft, to a uh, launcher. We are going to a commercial launcher that is actually launching satellites into space. I see. You'll basically lease space on this launcher? Exactly. But the fact that we're small means that we don't need to lease the whole yes. launch, but only a small portion All right. out of it. So you're going to build the craft. You don't have to worry about building the rocket and the launch site to get it up in the air. Exactly. Up in the space. All right. And 20 employees, 250 volunteers. What do they do? What do the volunteers do? Actually, a lot of the work. <laughs> in what way? And it's, it's amazing for us sometimes to see people that, you know, we see them in the office all day, and, you know, we know that they have another job, so we're not sure why they, are, they aren't being fired. <laughs> Uh, but amazing people, amazing engineers. I would say that half of the manpower, the general manpower, is actually working on building the spacecraft. Building it. Building. It's okay, designing I and building. Okay. You said that was an interesting story in and of itself. Yeah. The design and the building of the spacecraft. And again, this was not your area of expertise. You were communications. True. Tell me about that part of it and why it intrigues you. Okay. So I would say that Jonathan actually yes. led the, the, that part. And and building something that needs to work in space, it's an amazing thing. And, and the reason it's amazing, it's from a few reasons. One, it has to work on the first time. The second, there are so many different aspects and different disciplines that need to work together and work together and, and you know, be synchronized to the millimeter and, and make sure that everyone knows exactly, exactly what everyone else are doing. Uh, and, you know, one is an expert in temperature to make sure that they won't be too hot or too cold inside because when you're uh, out of the atmosphere, you get direct, uh, uh, you get the sun directly hitting you. On the other side, you don't have any sun, okay? And so it's actually absolute uh, zero. And so really cold, really hot, and that's one problem. You have so many other problems and you have to make sure that everyone will work together. That's in space in general. Now when you're building a spacecraft you're doing something that was never done before in Israel. Uh, we launched satellite, we moved them in space, but not to the distance of the moon. Okay? Uh, the distance uh, from Earth to the moon is 200,000 miles huge distance. It's hard sometimes to realize that when we're presenting to kids, we're trying to tell them so they realize how, you know, how far it is that if, we'll, if you'll sit in your car and drive, if there was a road to the moon, it will take you six months to get to the moon. Our spacecraft is going to do that in around two weeks. Okay? Uh, so it's, it's, it's a huge thing. Uh, so until today, Israeli technologies reach to around 10% of that distance. We're going to take it far, far away, and then we're going to, going to do something else that was never done before, and it's going to land, okay, in another place, not on Earth. We didn't land nothing on Earth like that, but, but again, it's in a whole different problem, a whole different place, and, and to do something that it's the first time in Israel, it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. We're happy to have all the talented people in Israel working together to solve all the different problems along the way. I saw that you were basically working with a $30 million budget. Is that still the budget you're working it's with? It's a bit more than that. I would yes. imagine, <laughs> yes. And at the moment, everybody who is on your on staff, they get paid. Yes. 
so at the moment you have the funds to pay them. In, in essence, the organization is supporting itself? Yes, and I would say that the, uh, we're working, uh, although we're working in space, and usually you know, it's, a, it's a nice place, but we're still working in a nonprofit. So even the people that are getting money, it's, not, it's still not the price that they would get yes. outside because they do that before, because they want to do that. I understand. Uh, but most of the money, I would say, doesn't go to the full-time employees in space hell. It goes to actually buying the parts and buying the lunch and buying the everything, all the different components mm -hmm. of the spacecraft, that's most of the money. Has the Israeli government been supportive of you? Yes. Tell me. Uh, by the rules of the competition, uh, you can get up to 10% governmental funding. So the Ministry of, uh, actually the Israeli Space Inge uh, Agency, which is part of the government, uh, is giving us around half of that money and working to get some more. Okay. Um, I was really wondering whether high-profile people in the Israeli government, you know, has the Prime Minister ever said anything about you? I see that President Perez does support you. Mm -hmm. But in general, do you have the kind of support on, uh, on the top echelons of Israeli government at the moment? Yes, uh, President Perez you know, supported us from the early beginning. It was really amazing. We have Did you get to meet him? Yes, in person, it was, uh, he's an amazing person. That's a whole different story, but really, he's amazing, an amazing person. Um, but we got a lot of support. We presented in a committee in, in the Knesset, and, you know, every time we, we need people, it's not just, it's, it, also people in the Knesset are excited from Space AI, I would say. Uh, it's something that I think, they say that kids are excited from three things. Uh, space, robots, and dinosaurs, okay? So we only have two out of three, okay? Robotic spacecraft, good, right? yes. yeah? Uh, but it's not just kids. It's even adults that think about the fact that we can do that are excited. Yes, you know, in America, after the space program was successful for a period of time, it seemed as if the American attitude changed and there was a feeling that was, first of all, when we lost some astronauts, that was very hard on the program. But there was also some real concern philosophically about whether money should be spent, public money should be spent on the space program and really what was it yielding and how important was it and, and did it make enough of a contribution. There's always been this fascination among people of the stars and going to the moon and Mars and who was no, who's uh, and, and space exploration and, and there's so many science fiction series on American television about traveling through space and yet at the same time there was this feeling so at least some questioning to what extent was it a responsible thing for a society to be spending its money on I want you to talk about the ambivalence that is in that equation on the one hand, there is this, this poetic side of man that reaches for the stars. And at the same time, there's this very down-to-earth, what's it cost? Is it worth the cost? There are people who are hungry. There are people who are in need. There are other kinds of social needs. How do you balance the two? So I'm asking you now to speak on two levels. First, what have you found that discussion to be in Israel itself? And how do you personally come out on the issue? Okay, so I would start, uh, I think, with the general uh, idea of going and exploring places we haven't been before. It's a huge thing, I would say, and also for me personally to know what's out there. But I do think that you need to look at the other part. And if you look deeper into that other part, so generally speaking, there are researchers that show that for every money, for every dollar that is invested in the space industry, you get in the long term seven dollars back. How? Um, for example, the, my glasses, they have a cover they have, uh, from uh, preventing scratches to be on the, these, uh, from the, on the glasses. Uh, it was designed actually by NASA for astronauts. Uh, shoes 
that uh, can uh, make sure that your knees won't get uh, hurt when you're running. Uh, it's technology that was built for astronaut. Even if you have um, coffee, uh, which is actually being made uh, in dry freeze, and uh, if you take a coffee in Israel, you, you use it more than in the States, but like, uh, uh, there are a lot of things in your daily life that you don't realize, but they were actually made for astronauts. And today, you know, you use them, you know, I buy a glasses and I say, yeah, put the cover. I'm not thinking about the fact that it came as a spin-off from the space industry, but it did. Okay, space is the most difficult place for engineer to work in. And because it's the most difficult place, they have to think creatively. They have to invent new things. Okay, so if you look at mankind, we learned a lot of things, we developed a lot of things that we use in our daily life, and we did that just because we had to solve something that was never been solved before. And so we have to invent new things. So that's one thing. That's you know, the general, if you look at, not just Israel, but if you look at Israel, Israel has amazing capabilities in space. Okay, amazing capabilities in space. We build the smallest satellites in the world. Okay, we consider one of the three leading countries in that field. I mean, one of the nine countries that know how to launch satellites by themselves. But it was only used uh, to military purposes until three years ago, where also Space AL started, but in the same time, the government decided to put money in the Israeli Space Agency to promote civilian space projects, okay? Because Israel has the potential to become a leader in the civilian space industry, uh, but we just need to, you know, put the resources to make it happen. And if you look, you said that, that uh, Israel is uh, the startup nation. If you look at technology and where it's going, the next arena in technology is space. The amount of satellites that are being launched every year is just growing. Now, almost, you know, if you look at the amount of countries that have satellites, it's, it's um, an amazing thing. They're trying to, now they're building satellites in Israel that will help farmers to see what's happening in their field in order to make sure that they will know if they need to put money, if they need to uh, go and make sure that they won't have any animals in their field. There are so many new things that are going to happen through space. And today, for Israel, there is an opportunity to seize that moment and to become a leader in that, you know, the future technology. Is it, is it also fair for me to assume that it is also good for Israeli morale? That there is something, it engenders a certain degree of pride. By the way, even in Jewish pride here, American Jews will take enormous pride in your success. But I would imagine for the Israeli people as well, as was true for Americans when Americans were, well, you know, every day it seemed we were doing something more in space. But it does do something for the self-identity and the self-perception of a people, a nation, if it is successful in this cutting edge area. Do you feel I am fair in saying that? Absolutely. When I'm, you know, presenting and I'm asking kids, but I like to ask also adults, what do you feel when you see that image? We have a photo, photoshopped image of the spacecraft on the moon, and they say that they are excited, they are proud. So it's, you know, it's not just me. <laughs> it's actually everyone that, uh, that we're meeting. When did it first happen for you? When in your life did space and the moon and the stars somehow grab your own attention and your own imagination? I think that th there are two parts for that question. One, it's always up, uh, up there, okay? There is a Birkat Levana, I would say, and you look up at, uh, at the moon. Uh, Blessing of the moon. Yeah. Um, so it's always, it was always up there. And uh, so, you know, to be curious what's going on was from my early beginning. I just was a very curious g kid in everything, I would say. Did you ever, ever have a telescope? Yes, I had a telescope. And you would look? I would look. Okay, and what else? Uh, but the second part is actually not, is not relevant to space. It's about building things, amazing things that will have impact on Israel, 
I would say, on the Jewish people at all, uh, on the future, on humanity. You know, if you look at our project, you know, you talked about uh, pride, both in Israel and abroad. Uh, but this project will have so many other, uh, you know, impacts. It, it, we're building the smallest uh, and, you know, most cost-effective spacecraft that was ever designed. You said that 30 plus million dollars, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's a fraction of other space missions. It, it's, it means that in the future, with the same, the same amount of resources, you could take the Israeli technologies and do not just one mission, but you can do a hundred missions. And you know, if you think about that impact, like if I would tell you, study Earth, tell me what's the temperature in Earth, and you can just stand here, like outside the, these offices, you will get a very limited answer. But if you can stand here, and also stand in Jerusalem, and also stand in London, and in Moscow, and like in a lot of places around the world, you got much a, a better answer. So potentially, you'll be able to do much more science with the technology that, that we're developing here today. Mm -hmm. And beside that, we're also working to take with us on scientific experiment. So the scientific community will have, you know, from the from our mission, we'll learn a, a lot of things. So. When do you hope, if this works out, that you would launch? your little teeny tiny but very effective robotic vehicle? So I would say that today we have most of the resources that are needed to do that. Uh, but one major thing that we need to finalize is the launch agreement. Uh, we are planning to, to sign on a launch that will happen around two years from today. But we, until we won't sign, mm -hmm. we won't have that specific date. Okay. And when do you learn if you've won or not? Oh, you win if you're the first one to get it up there. Competition. Right. So are you anxious about the progress of other competitors? I will tell you a few things. We are looking about what other competitors uh, do. And uh, as you said, we are considered one of the two, three leading uh, competitors. Uh, I would say that not all the 18 teams that are left in the competition are actually working to land on the moon. Some of them are working on other projects and they're not focused on, on the moon. So we are looking about what other people are doing, but, but today it's much bigger than the competition. Okay, it started from the competition. Today when we look at our mi mission and our vision, our mission is to land the first Israeli spacecraft on the moon. Okay? Our vision is to make an impact both in Israel and abroad, to make sure that there will be more scientists and engineers to build the next spacecrafts, uh, and to engage kids and to inspire kids. We're also working very hard <laughs> to make sure we'll be the first. Yes, but it's almost as if, I hope you win the prize. I really hope you win the prize. But it almost is, it's not like it's irrelevant, but it is no longer really the focus here. The focus is building something much larger and the prize would be nice for you. It would also fund some of the things you want to do. But what you're creating now is a much lar it's much larger than simply a piece of equipment that will one day be on the moon, yes? True. And that's really the contribution. You and your two colleagues and Space IL are really doing. You're making a difference in Israel in a much larger sense. And I wanted to get your sense of what, whether there is in Israel today, and I'm now talking about rank and file in the education system, young people, those who graduate. You were in an elite division of the IDF. Not everybody is going to be elite. And every now and then we hear, quite honestly, disappointing reports about the educational system in the state of Israel, that it has in some way deteriorated in a way that we would not have expected. I want your sense, Kafir. How do you feel about the educational system in general, about the extent to which there are enough talented, qualified people in your field and in the related fields that you're now dealing with? To what extent do you hope that what you're doing now may change that picture? So I would tell you that uh, one of our volunteers is actually in his day job as uh, working in the army to recruit 
uh, those uh, kids that are supposed to come and you know take the technological parts uh, uh, jobs in the in the IDF and I know you know from him also that Israel each year is missing 12 12,000, the IDF is missing 12,000 candidates each year. Say that again. 12,000 candidates for the IDF. The IDF could use another 1,200. Not could use, needs. Needs, <laughs> needs 1,200 a year that aren't there. Yes. And, and the IDF is doing a lot of work to, to try to impact that. And I would say that also people in the Ministry of Education, they understand that, We're all working together. We look at ourselves as, you know, part of this movement. Okay, we're there are a lot of groups and organizations that works in Israel to uh, to promote uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, but even by the way, it's not a problem that's just in Israel. It's also in the states. Okay, there was very much so. Absolutely, th there was a research for the Obama administration three years ago to try to understand why and why kids are not going to study STEM, okay, science, technology, engineering, and math. And they saw that there are two reasons. One is preparation, and some kids are not prepared when they're young, so when they are older, they don't have the basic skill and knowledge to allow them to, to study. That's part of the problem. But the other half is inspiration. Uh, even if they are prepared, if uh, potentially they can go and study, they just choose to study other things. Okay, and if you look back uh, on Neil Armstrong walking his, his first steps on the moon, I wasn't alive uh, back then, unfortunately. But kids that saw that were excited. Uh, and they wanted to become scientists, they wanted to become engineers. There's actually a huge peak in the number of kids that went to study these fields. Uh, from the first moment uh, Kennedy uh, initiated the space, uh, the space program to the last man that worked uh, on the moon. There's a huge peak in the numbers of kids that chose uh, this direction. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. to, use, to use, you know, using is, is a word that it's not, it's not nice to say. We're using the spacecraft, but for me it's good. We're using the spacecraft in order to make that impact. That was in 1969 to make it happen in two years from today. I understand. Uh, both in Israel, but I would say also around the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, today we have uh, volunteers. We have 50 volunteers that uh, met more than 55,000 kids all around Israel in person. Uh, we also working with the Minister of Education to build curriculums for teachers to do in their schools, working with the uh, Davidson Institute and Tasieda and a lot of other organization that already exist to take our story, to take our message and to reach as many kids as we can. We also, besides doing that through the educational uh, uh, system, we're also going to television, to prime time. We'll meet the kids wherever they are and we'll speak about science and we'll speak about engineering and we'll speak about technology and hopefully we'll be able to spark something there. That's right. You're using television to communicate your message. Television, internet, uh, schools, uh, after school activities, everywhere, okay? And this, we started that from, uh, from Israel, but we gave a lot of lectures abroad. We gave a lecture in LA, in New York, and you know, you saw the, the, the spark in kids' eyes. And actually parents and, and uh, teachers came to us and told us also, that beside, you know, sparking for science, it's something that can connect Jewish kids that didn't feel connected to Israel in the past, but through that story, they're able to. Mm -hmm. And so now we're working with the Eye Center and we're developing curriculums for teachers in the state uh, to be able to take that to their classroom, to take that to their communities and connect all those kids. And mm -hmm. uh, we're doing a lot of work, we actually, uh, we've been working a lot of on a campaign that we're trying. We're going to open in a month, I would say. We're also in uh, in New York in the Israel Day Parade. We're leading it in a float. Um, but we want everyone to be able to take part, and we're actually going to allow people to send a message in our spacecraft or to buy a ticket, a virtual ticket on the Israeli spacecraft that is flying to the moon, <laughs> and. and Again, it's not about the money. 
really. It's about allowing them that after we land, they will have an active part, an active role in, you know, in the blue and white uh, moment of the 21st uh, century. Uh, they were part of it. This is what we're trying to do. Fabulous. Kola Kavod. You're married. Yeah. Do you have children yet? It is uh, eight months old. Just <laughs> started to crawl two days ago. Mazal <laughs> Toda. What's your wife's name? Dotan. Dotan. How does Dotan feel about the work you're doing? And by the way, out of curiosity, it take me back to 2010 when Kafir comes to Dotan. And were you married then? No. Yep. You weren't married yet. I see. So it's not fair for me to say what was your wife's attitude <laughs> towards your dream. But in general, how does she react to this whole program? You know, in the beginning, it sounds a, a bit crazy. She said, okay, <laughs> you, can, you can try. And, you know, even us, we didn't know by the very last day of 2010 if we'll be able to register or not. Uh, and it, you know, she, it, it became clear and clear that it's actually happening. Today, it's a fact. Um, and it wasn't easy. Along the way, there are, you know, a lot of times that we didn't see each other Were for you discouraged? Week. Were you discouraged ever? What do you mean? When you said it was hard times, did you ever become discouraged and feel, oh, this will never work, and how, how did I get involved in this, and uh, maybe it was a mistake? Did you ever feel any of that? I think that there were hard parts along the way. It wasn't easy. But I think that... The three of us supported each other. I think that my wife, even if it was hard for her, she really, really supported me and also the rest of my family. How would your parents feel? Uh, proud. <laughs> Good. They never said to you, oh, you're Meshuga. They didn't say Meshuga. They, would, they, they said that, you know, you have a family now, you need to take care of them, but, uh, but not Meshuga. Okay. I assume, by the way, now you're able to support your family. You're doing fine. I'm doing fine. Okay. And they're just proud as can be, yes? They're proud, yeah. Yes. And I'm sure Dotan's parents, they're proud of you as well. I mean, just, we're all, I'm proud of you. I've only met you. I'm proud of you. Everything, I'm sure the audience is proud of you. Everything about this is to be proud. And, and again, I hope you win the prize. It's not about the prize. I think you said that very, very well. We, we're proud of you now. You've created something much, much bigger than a, a competition for a prize. Um, it's important to me to say, first of all, thank you, but it's, you know, when I'm giving a lecture on Space Hell, I have a, a picture with the three of us, the three uh, founders of the project, and I'm saying that the most important thing on this uh, image is to realize that three people can do it by themselves. And there, today, Space Hell exists just because so many people together are working to make it happen. Okay, now you're a nonprofit. True. What's your website if somebody wants to learn more about what you're doing and if they want to be involved? What's the website? It's spaceil.com. Okay. Uh, and I assume anybody here in America who wants to learn about you and maybe become involved, they go to SpaceIL, they'll be able to learn everything they need to know, yes? Yes, both the website and you can also uh, go to SpaceIL on Facebook and we're there. Just fabulous. I want you to remember the day when there was a Friday. It was the last day you either got it done or you could not be part of this competition. Yeah. And you do get it done, right? Are the three of you together that day? We met in the bank and signed on the wire transfer for the money. We actually, uh, one of the uh, employees in the bank, her daughter had a, a birthday. So there was a cake there and she gave us a cake and we have a picture <laughs> of the three of us sitting with a cake. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> was it a thrilling moment for you? It was a crazy moment. It was a thrilling moment, but a scary moment because, you know, it's happening. And uh, there were so many moments from that on, like when we had, a few months later, the President Paris came to support us. So we have an event with President Paris in Israeli airspace industries, and, and, and you have to make it happen. Uh, so it's both exciting but also, you know, you feel the pressure and you feel, you know, that you have to do everything in your power to make it happen. And today we're really happy that we have all the employees. We actually hired a, a CEO six months ago. 
he uh, ran Amdocs Australia, uh, a division in, in partner in Israel. And now he, you know, after he stopped working, we, continue, we convinced him to, to go back to work and, uh, and work in Space AL. That's amazing. Do you imagine yourself, you know, let's, you know, say you launch the next two years, whether you win the prize, you don't win the prize, you've created now a living, vibrant, existing, you know, space program in Israel that is going to, I think, inspire people as you hope it does. Do you see yourself staying there? Do you have other dreams that you wish for yourself? If, if you know, I would imagine you will become a very hot property yourself and that people may really enlist you to, to begin something else and maybe in the industry where you're not non-profit but you're in some entrepreneurial position in the state of Israel. Does any of that interest you and excite you? I think that building new things and making, you know, taking dreams and make them into our reality is something that in space sale it, it's a huge dream. Yes. But even if I look at my past along the way, even in the army, I, I was like the first officer of a group that wasn't, didn't exist before. And like, this is what I like to do, to take ideas and make, it, make them happen. Okay, so. this will, it, Kfir, I'm convinced it'll always be who you are. Okay. Before I have to say goodbye to you, and by we, when I, I'm not going to say, Hitraot, we will see each other often, I'm sure. Love it. You represent something, and I hope you understand. You're on Shalom TV, people are watching you all over America, Jewish, non Jewish. You're a young Israeli today who is doing something extraordinarily exciting. Very often we hear in America a certain kind of concern about the future of the young Jewish generation. Not only here in America, where there's real concern about where young people are going and how engaged are they, how knowledgeable or unknowledgeable are they about Jewish things, Jewish history, the state of Israel, their own Jewish tradition, to what extent are young people really identifying as Jews and seeing themselves in the Jewish future. But we hear the same thing is true within the state of Israel. What, to what extent should we be concerned about your generation as it is moving forward? To what extent will it have a Jewish feel, a Jewish neshama, Jewish sensitivity? To what extent is Israel in danger of becoming simply a Hebrew-speaking Middle Eastern state as opposed to a, a Jewish state. I want you to give me your sense of where your generation is. And I don't want to embarrass you. There's, you're clearly atypical in certain ways. At the same time, you were part of a generation. You have friends. Your wife has friends. You grew up with you know, kids in school, in high school, and college, and then IDF, etc. Kafir, give me your sense of where you feel at the moment your generation, the younger generation is, what concerns you and what gives you a sense of optimism. So I would say that today, as a father, there are a lot of uh, other concerns that uh, comes. And I actually started to add uh, my child's uh, image uh, in the last slide, and I really hope wish to people that they will follow their dreams, but now I added that I hope that they will dream on things that will make the future better for our children. Uh, but that's really general. Um, you said that I'm representing something, and I'm presenting both Space AL, both my generation. I think that there, there are a lot of different voices in my generation. Uh, I know, you know, my, my answer. Uh, and for me, Jewish values and Judaism is something that is really important. I think that, you know, be, being part of your past, it's important to be part of your present and your future. It's not something I said, you know, smarter people said that before. Um, I think there is a lot of work that should be done to make sure that it will stay. I would also say that, you know, uh, through this project I had a glimpse about what's going on beyond the borders of Israel. And I'm really excited that Space AL have, has the opportunity to take part in that effort uh, abroad. Uh, I think that it's 
two different problems, in, both in Israel and abroad, and both from my friends that are living abroad. It's, it's something else. And I think, you know, it's important for us to also make sure that we'll do whatever is necessary to make our kids feel part of their tradition and past. It has been spectacular meeting you. You are an amazing human being. Kol Tuva Hatzlacha in everything you do, personally, professionally. And I hope there are many opportunities that I get to sit and learn from you. You're really a very special soul, and I thank you so much for giving time. One more time, the website is? SpaceAL, one word, on Facebook or SpaceAL.com. We'd love to everyone to join. Fabulous, thank you. My meeting with Kfar Damari, one of the founders of the Israeli space company Space IL, which is on the one hand competing for the $30 million Google Lunar X prize to be the first private company to land a vehicle on the moon. But what you've heard him say is he's doing something much, much bigger. And what it really is about is how you create a sense of Jewish identity in the state of Israel through the space program. And I hope you have been as moved by him as I have. Of course, as always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to the, any of the ideas that Kafir has expressed here. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.